and welcome everyone. I'm Jenny Wiley with Heritage Preservation, and we are so glad that you're joining us today. Kristen Lace, our Vice President of Collection Care Programs at Heritage Preservation, will also join us today. Let me go ahead and start by giving a quick introduction to the community and these webinars, and we'll move on to our next topic. Heritage Preservation is moderating the Connecting to Collections online community in cooperation with the American Association for State and Local History and with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The site is designed and produced by Learning Times. The goal of the online community is to help smaller museums, libraries, archives, and historical societies quickly locate reliable preservation resources and network with their colleagues. In developing the community, we have drawn on many resources that were developed for the C2C initiative, including the bookshelf and the Raising the Bar workshops and webinars. Links to these resources are filed under the Topics menu on the site. We will also file a recording of today's webinar there. About twice a month, the online community features are a helpful preservation resource and host a webinar related to it. The resources we posted for today's webinars can be accessed by clicking this photo on our webpage at www.connectingtocollections.org. Today I am pleased to welcome back Rachel Perkins Ehrenstein, a conservator in private practice. Rachel was kind enough to speak earlier this year on a C2C webinar about choosing a data logger. Today she'll take us one step further as we explore wireless data logging options. Rachel, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Thank you, Jenny. Um, I am an objects conservator by training, but um, starting in my uh, sort of former institutionalized um, experience and, and currently now in my private practice as a partner at AM Art Conservation, um, I particularly enjoy preventive care projects, uh, especially ones like environmental monitoring that involve uh, fun technology and, and some cool gadgets. Uh, in addition to my um, private practice work, I um, also chair the Integrated Pest Management Working Group, which sponsors the museumpests.net website. And I'm the e-editor for the American Institute for Conservation and one of the organizing members of AIC's new Collection Care Network, which provides support for cultural heritage professionals um, who are working in all areas of preventive care. And um, I hope that all of you on the call will start hearing more about the CCN and its projects um, through um, various venues soon. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm going to go ahead and move over your PowerPoint. During the presentation, please feel free to type in any questions. And if we can't get to it right away, we will do our best to get to it towards the end of the presentation. Rachel, I'll go ahead and pass things over to you. OK. Well, um, it wasn't a surprise to me when Jenny's predecessor, Elsa, and I examined the reviews of the last webinar on data loggers. Um, the big request was for a follow-up program on wireless systems. Um, we all walk around now with our cell phones, and we seem to be able to beam all sorts of information to ourselves and to each other. So why wouldn't we want to do that with our environmental data? The technology exists, and there are products out there that are being used and marketed to the museum community. But we really need to examine carefully whether wireless systems work for us, um, or you know, in this case, work for you, or whether your environmental monitoring needs are better served by a standalone data logger. Um, just because the technology is out there and because it's actually sort of cool may not be the best reason to, to go wireless. So, um, so the overarching message for today's webinar um, is is really going to be some hard thinking about whether this is you know this is the right route. Um, so I just want to get a few basics out of the way for those of you who are on the last webinar with me on data loggers for museum monitoring. The focus was specifically on what I call standalone data loggers. And those are battery-powered devices that have a sensor to monitor conditions and a microprocessor that stores the information. Um, and let's see. Uh, Jenny, remind me, do you advance the PowerPoint? No. Or can I can I do, do that, that, but you can also do it. There should be arrows in the lower left-hand corner. There it is. OK. There you go. Go. OK. So 
So um, thank you. So the um, so the standalone data loggers uh, and wireless systems all have you know a number of things in common. Um, the they have you know these are battery powered devices that have sensor to monitor the conditions and a microprocessor that stores the information. Um, for a standalone data logger, each one works independently, and you have to download the data to view the results. But for today's program, we're discussing something you know slightly different. It's actually a sort of a misnomer to use the term wireless logger. Um, some of the these systems, some of these units. Uh, do log and store the information, but more appropriate would be to talk about wireless monitoring systems. Because for the most part, these wireless sensors aren't really logging and storing the information, or at least for not very long. They're relaying it back to a collection point, whether that's the nearest Ethernet connection or a PC back in your office or lab. So um, let's take a moment just to find out what the audience is currently using. Jenny, do you want to ask the first poll question? Sure. And maybe even the second. Go ahead and pull these over. So which of the following equipment are you using to monitor? And then we also want to know, oh, I lost it. I also have to admit that when I saw the um, the uh, site mm -hmm. for um, the, the posting on on the connecting to collections online community, I sort of chuckled at the picture because, of course, what what is being shown there is a nice picture of a Hobo um, U14 from Onset, which is in fact a standalone data logger and not a wireless logger. So for any of you who've been looking at the website, um, don't confuse that with a, <laughs> with a product that, that we will be talking about today. Well, it looks okay. like a lot of the answers are standalone data loggers, 70%. And then one or five spaces being monitored. Okay. I'll go ahead and pull these off. OK. So that's, um, that's interesting. and, and Sort of more or less what um, what I expected, given what we know generally about the the connecting to collections um, online community. Um, I I've been asked also by the National Park Service to do another conservagram on wireless systems. Um, they've been asking for a while, and I've been mulling over how to structure it because it isn't as straightforward as examining and evaluating the standalone loggers. Um, however. Some of the parameters for any logging or you know, monitoring system is still important. So I, I want to quickly run through those. Um, I know that everyone wants to get to the products, but the products keep changing. And they'll continue to, to change frequently. So I think this information is really important in um, being able to evaluate any system from one that's out now to the next hot thing um, that will come out in a year from now. So um, some of the, uh, the hardware specifications that you'll want to look into, no matter what um, logger or wireless um, monitoring system you're using, are going to include these parameters here. Um, operating range is pretty straightforward. This is the range of temperature and relative humidity over which the logger will work. So generally, most of the sensors, and certainly the ones that I'm going to talk about today, function over a temperature range um, you know, beyond what we expect to see in our collection environments. So um, temperature is generally not an issue. But you do sometimes have to pay close attention to the RH range. Um, some of them will, will monitor from 0 to 100 uh, percent RH in a non-condensing environment. But for instance, the um, T and D log EZ, which I'll talk about later, has an RH operating range of 15 to 90%. So if you're monitoring um, a case, a sealed you know, a case with archaeological metals um, and silica gel uh, that you're trying to keep as dry as possible, or if you're in the southwest you know, where your conditions are extremely dry, um, you need to make sure you know, that that um, 
parameter is going to be sufficient for you. Um, another thing that, um, that you want to just sort of take a look at is accuracy. Um, we, we all want to know that our data is accurate, and some of these products are calibrated more carefully than others. Um, generally, every, you know, everything we'll be talking about today is more than sufficient for our purposes. Um, but remember, just like with any monitoring equipment, if you aren't checking the accuracy um, and the calibration every year or a couple of years, you can't have faith in the accuracy of your data. Um, and so I believe in the um, resources that is on the, the website uh, for, for this webinar. There's a sheet um, that was also uh, given out at the previous webinar that my colleague Samantha Alderson and I wrote up on how you can check the accuracy of your loggers, um, a little system that you can you know, set up with, with um, relatively easy to find materials. Um, that will also be coming out um, probably later this year, the conservagram. So um, power source and battery life. This is something that I'll go over when we get to the product-specific information. But some of these units um, are solely battery operated, and others need to be plugged into a power source. So play co pay close attention to battery life um, to make sure that you're going to get enough power for your project and you know, for however long. Um, you know, the, the ability to use a wireless system to relieve you of the need to download your data um, may not be um, you know, a, as good a trade-off if you still have to replace batteries every six months. Um, sampling rate is uh, how often uh, the, the logger will take the, the, the data, the temperature and RH data, or anything else that you're, you're monitoring. Um, in, for wireless systems, you often have a sampling rate and then a transmission rate. Uh, if you're monitoring for general trends, um, you can be collecting data every 20 to 30 minutes. But if you're monitoring, let's say, the efficacy of your HVAC system, you may need more frequent readings. And so you need to just pay attention to whether you can set the sampling rate, and if not, whether you'll be getting enough or, or too much data for your, for your project. Uh, and the products we'll be talking about today um, you know, uh, run the, the gamut on, on that. Um, you have uh, some of these systems have alerts and alarms, some you know, on a LCD display like the standalone data loggers. And um, some of them also have the ability to uh, email or text message uh, you, you know, to send it to your phone. And this is a great feature, but if you're not already, you know, or soon to be a convert to the, to you know, the smartphone, um, this you know may not be a feature that that you really need. Um, displays some of the um, just like with the standalone loggers, some of the wireless uh, loggers also have an LCD. Um, but if the logger isn't in a place where you'll be able to view the readout, the display may not be a desirable feature for you because it certainly comes at the expense of battery life. Um, size, appearance, and construction um, is you know, something just to take a look at. It's sometimes hard to tell this on the website. I tried to, um, for the units that I've played with, and I, I had images of, you know, I sort of include a penny so you can sort of get a sense of the scale. On the website, it's sometimes hard to know, you know, are they sort of fist size? Are they smaller? Are they larger? Um, the, the wireless units, some of them are, you know, the smallest is, is fairly small, like sort of a fat candy bar. But generally, wireless units are a bit bigger than the standalone loggers. They tend to be sort of um, anywhere, you know, some, sometimes up to sort of like walkie-talkie size. So just something to, to keep in mind. Um, one thing that's a different uh, feature on the wireless sensors than, um, than on standalone loggers is uh, buffering capacity. And this um, sort of I alluded to a little bit earlier. So wireless monitors don't always log, um, but it is a good and desirable feature if, if the sensor has the ability to store some data. And that's important in case your transmission is interrupted. Then the data isn't lost. It can be held by the sensor and sort of sent when the system is, is back online later. Um, and so the number of sample points is something that you know you might want to pay attention to. 
Uh, and certainly cost is a big thing. That's something that very often you know, I find most institutions that I work with um, very often start off with, with a budget. You know, they, even, even before they've really determined the, the project needs, they sort of know, uh, you know that they have a few thousand dollars to spend. And then it becomes a question of, you know, how, you know, how do you want to spread that around? Is, uh, do you need more sampling points, or do you need more features? Um, standalone data loggers range from $70 up to $700, depending on the features. And there um, are a few other ancillary costs. Uh, for wireless systems, you're going to pay more per sensor a data point. Um, and there are some other costs to factor in. So determining your budget is going to um, help you clarify what else you might need to sacrifice for this, um, for this capability. Um, so those are some of the things that are sort of mostly the same. Um, let's take a look at some of the, the reasons why you know can be great. Um, the first is if you have lots of data. Um, the wireless systems don't need you know cable or flash drive or a portable download device. They communicate without all those extras. So if you're using a wireless system, you you can eliminate the time spent going around your institution and, and physically downloading the, the data. Um, this can be hugely beneficial if you're in an institution that needs to monitor a lot of data points. And by a lot, I, I mean you know, generally more than 20. Um, and so for the most part from the, the poll, I think that was, that was uh, most of you were, were well under that. Um, we asked, Jenny, we, that was the, the, the poll question on how many spaces um, or sensors you're currently monitoring. Right? Our, our big space was uh, one to five for the most answers, and then quickly yeah. followed by 20 or more. OK, terrific. So, so we do have sort of a, a split there. So if you're, if you're at 20 or more, the, the actual work of managing your data and getting around to collect those you know, can become cumbersome. And so that's when, when uh, looking at a wireless system you know, sort of um, starts to, to maybe make some sense. Um, the second is whether you need real-time data. Um, it is sort of cool, and it's also super convenient to sit at your desk and click into your monitoring system to see what's going on. Um, however, the main advantage to having real-time data is the ability to quickly learn of and respond to problematic conditions in your collection environment. So if you're in an institution without climate control, you don't actually have the ability to make corrections. And therefore, real-time knowledge, while nifty, doesn't necessarily advance your collection care. Um, so I'm going to emphasize this again. If you don't have an HVAC system, you probably need to have another compelling reason why you would want a wireless system. So um, Vinny, let's ask um, the next poll question. Um, do you have the ability to control the environment in your space? OK, well, it's moving around a little bit, but it seems like the overwhelming majority of our attendees do have at least some ability. Um, so that's good. OK, I'm seeing um, Michael from Atlanta saying some, but not all spaces. And that's pretty, pretty standard as well. Um, you might have it in sort of you know, a new edition or in some of your you know, special exhibition spaces, um, but you know, not in all of your storage or you know, all of your galleries. Um, so it's just something to, to think about, you know, the, the cost of having that real-time data if you, if you can't actually respond. Um, one of the, the first places where I um, installed a system that had real-time data, we had a facility manager who, you know, was on his, um, you know, had a, a beeper and responded to things, you know, 24/7. So for him, you know, getting those um, those messages in the middle of the night, he was going to be up and, and on that. If you know, if that's not something you can do, then you know, all of that groovy technology is um, is you know, 
not being maximized. But one of the um, other compelling reasons to use a wireless system, especially if we're talking about an institution that may only have climate control in, um, in certain spaces, would be whether you have enclosed spaces that you need to monitor. So for instance, when I was at the American Museum of Natural History, one of the cases I had to monitor was that of um, a, 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 what was called Copper Man. He was a, a mineralized mummy of a, an ancient Chilean miner. And the case was, um, was very tightly sealed. It was buffered with um, silica gel to keep the RH down as low as possible. And a single wireless monitor would have been great to know, what, you know when I needed to open that case and recondition the gel. On a slightly larger scale, you could have you know, a special exhibit space where um, the lender requests specific conditions and requires the case to be sealed after the courier leaves, and something like a wireless transmission um, system. Um, the case would allow you to monitor the microclimate without you know, having to, to go in. So those would be um, you know, some justifications for, for looking at a, a wireless system. The next question, though, is you know, whether you're really ready for, for wireless. Um, so you know, the, the questions that you need to ask are, you know, do you have the, the budget? Um, again, the wireless systems are going to be more expensive than, um, than the standalone data loggers. Um, just like with you know, the standalone data loggers, there's also a lot of wireless systems out there. Um, and so in choosing the, the products that um, I wanted to talk about today, I tried to keep in mind that the connecting to collections community is geared towards smaller institutions. Um, and so while there's a lot of products out there for advanced users, or components to make you know, cool custom systems, that isn't what I thought was going to be most useful for this audience. So Jenny, let's um, take a look at uh, poll question number six. What is the most um, important criteria in choosing an environmental monitoring system? Um, I think that one um, is going to, to be something that maybe we'll take a, a look at at the end. Um, so, and go ahead and feel free to type your answer in. And this is actually one of our door prize questions. So we'll choose somebody at random, and you'll win a free gift. That should be to provide some incentive. <laughs> um, OK, so we're seeing some interesting things here. You know, cost is coming up as a, as a big issue. Ease of use, um, so that makes me feel good about the, the kinds of things that we're going to discuss in a little bit. Um, data analysis. Data analysis, this is really interesting. That's um, Catherine from um, Atlanta. Um, for data analysis, I have to say that this is not a strong suit right now for the wireless um, system. So um, Gretchen, um, who's in, in Pittsburgh, has uh, a number of buildings over, you know, um, in, uh, you know different spaces, and so that's certainly something. If you have off-site um, where where um, where wireless is, you know, is going to be a huge help, so that you know so you don't if you don't physically have the ability to get to that space all the time. Um, so just to um, there's still more stuff coming in, but but that's sort of the we're seeing the same same kinds of things. So that's that's good. So in addition to um, you know, having a clear idea of your budget and, and how much you're going to be able to get you know, for a wireless versus a standalone system, you need to know whether you have um, the capabilities. So for some of the systems we're going to look at today, um, not all of them, but several of them require that you have a network within your institution. And so if you don't know, you know what a, a router is or what it looks like, if you don't know what a, a LAN is, um, hopefully you have someone else in your institution that does. And if not, the wireless systems may not be you know, right for you um, unless you're, you're willing to, to delve in and, and really work your, your way you know, um, through the instruction manual. So um, I'll give you an example. Um, this is a, a Newport ITHX. Um, this is being used by um, 
by a number of different institutions. Um, they tend to be uh, larger institutions. And um, if, if this sort of looks like a little scary to you with the wires and the probes and you know, things sort of sticking out, um, if you aren't good with Excel, if you don't you know, know what a TCP IP packet, Ethernet LAN, or an SD flash card uh, means, then this isn't the system for you. It's, you know, it's great. It's good to know that there's a lot of other stuff out there beyond what I'm going to talk about today. But what I really am fo going to focus on, um, for the most part, are systems that are either sort of plug and play, meaning that you can you know, um, reasonably order them from you know, the, the vendor or distributor, open the box, read the instructions, and get yourself set up. Um, but I will talk about a couple of systems that are a little bit more advanced. And those do require a knowledgeable IT person in your institution. Um, you need to be able to either get through a firewall. You need to be able to set up a, a static IP address. Um, and within that parameter, um, there aren't actually that many good choices. There's a lot of stuff sort of out there. It's in the pipeline, but um, it isn't quite you know um, as as um, polished as I think our profession um, has come to expect. Um, so let's just quickly look at how many people sort of fall into um, this um, sort of second category. So Jenny, let's ask the, the next one. Do you have an IT department or at least one staff member with experience in wireless or networking technology? Okay. Well, so far it's looking good for those capabilities. People are still answering. Okay. Well, that that's um that's good news for for m most of you. Um. Okay. Let's see. So um. Before we sort of jump into the actual products, I, I just want to say that you know, wireless doesn't necessarily mean that all the systems upload data to the cloud. Um, some of these systems are going to work off your internal network. Um, and while the transmission is wireless, it's transmitting back to a sole point. And then in some cases, you can choose to make it web accessible. This is sort of important when you consider who needs to see your data. Um, and ideally, there are a number of people in your institution who should be seeing your data. So, um, you know, that's that's another uh, poll question that um, Jenny can can ask you. You know, who else are you sharing your data with? Ideally, you should be sharing it with um, your facility administrator. Um, and um, you know, who else is uh, whether it's your administration or your curator? If you love the capabilities of the old IPI PEM data site or the, the new eClimate notebook that they've, um, that they've rolled everything into, you may be better off collecting your data manually and sharing it in the cloud. So for instance, I just set up an institutional client in Massachusetts with some new monitoring equipment. And they only had the need and budget for five monitoring points. And they had very limited technological capabilities. So for them, in fact, the you know, a product like the PEM2 was more manageable, and I can log in and see the data from New York, and I can discuss it with their um, house manager and the chairman of the board, who's you know in a third location. So, uh, so this is just one of these things to you know keep in mind. Um, you know, whether you you want to be you know how you want to be sharing your data and and. Do you want people to be able to see you know, raw data, graphing? Do you need to be manipulating those graphs? Do you need to be comparing that? Those are some of the features that um, aren't so easily done um, on, the, um, on the wireless software products that we have to date. So OK, let's get to the, the meat of it now. And um, we're going to start with the product that's um, one of the products that's been out there for a while. This is the onset um, Hobo ZW data nodes. And um, this is really the first sort of plug-and-play plug system that I came across. Um, I think our, our field um, is 
broadly familiar with um, with Onset. A lot of us are using um, other Onset Hobo products, and Onset has become popular with our profession because they have you know reasonable products at reasonable prices. Um, and and I I think this is you know generally um, an example of that. The the data nodes and you. Um, have one here um, with the internal sensors and, and one here um, sort of in the, the middle with the, the long cord, which has an external sensor. Uh, they, uh, they take the readings and they transmit the data wirelessly to a receiver connected to, um, to your PC. So they um, log and wirelessly transmit real-time data, uh, and each um, sensor will sort of transmit um, back to each other, um, and the the sensors can act either as just sensors or as um, sort of sensor um, repeaters or you know routers as they they're called. Um, so you you develop what's called like a, a mesh network where the, the data can sort of go um, from from one to another to get back to your your central collecting point. Uh, they they. Say that they have um, when when you read the wireless specs, they tend to talk about um, their transmission range. But it's important to to note that for most of these systems, they're talking about um, a line of sight, like an unobstructed uh, distance. So if they say you know transmission range is 100 meters line of sight, if you're setting that up in a place with you know walls, um, you, you've already cut down your transmission substantially. Um, some of the things that are you know, nice features about the, um, the Hobo series is that they have, um, you can get alarm conditions via notifications. And I think, um, and here, this is a, an image from one of their spreadsheets of, of what the alarms, um, you know, uh, alerts beam to your um, I, iPhone look like. And here, um, you also have two views of um, the Hobo Node Manager, which is a module in the Hobo HoboWare Pro software. So on the left, you have sort of your um, floor plan view. And what you see there with all those lines going back and forth is you know, how the, this sort of idea of the mesh network, how the nodes can transmit from, from one to another back to this um, collection point at the, the top of the screen. Um, the image on the lower right shows you your um, node manager software. And then when you want to, to um, further analyze the software, you'd actually sort of open it up into the Hobo Wear Pro. So if you're using other Hobo products and you're happy you know, and familiar with the Hobo Wear software, you know, that's an advantage. Um, you can get up to 100 nodes on a system, but, but really um, you need a router. Um, for every 10 nodes. So that's something to pay attention to because it's going to affect the, the cost of, of your system. For, you know, for every um, you know, number of sensors, you need, you need a router. Um, so the system requirements, and I should, I should tell you all now that um, I have a, a handout that lists all of the things that I'm going through now. It lists you know, these selected features, system requirements, potential limitations, and the general cost per sensor for each of these. So don't um, feel frantic if I'm going through this quickly. Um, uh, Jenny is going to, to load this up along with the, the PowerPoint, so you'll be able to, to download that and have it for, for reference. Um, so the system requirements for the um, Hobo node is that um, you need at least one data node and the data receiver, and the software is included. Um, but depending on your deployment, you may need more of these routers. And so um, the, the sensors run about $250, the receiver is about $200, and the router is about $160. Um, so you know, depending on how far you can send your signal, that's going to determine um, the cost of your system. Um, the sort of difficulty is that you need to, to play around. And in my personal experience, um, that 100 meters line of sight uh, drops down immediately in any kind of environment. I set the system up in my home, and um, 
you know, I live in a sort of typical timber frame um, construction. And uh, I, you know, I had trouble getting from my home office upstairs, sort of down, downstairs. Uh, so the, the thing that you, you know, it's, it's really important for a system like this to, um, to, to understand that your budget may not go as far as you like um, if, if you need to be um, sending your signal across, you know, distances. Um, the other thing that we should talk about are some of the things that will interfere with wireless communications. Um, so the big issue is that the, your building fabric and construction will affect um, your wireless transmission. So some of the things that you need to, to think about are, um, you know, sort of the actual positioning, but just knowing your overall construction may also help, you know, determine whether something like this is really, um, you know, in a practical way going to work for you. Um, you the, a lot of the, the um, vendors recommend that you place that you don't place the units near metal building elements, which would be you know, sort of corrugated walls, floors, you know, metal floors, um, and staircases. Um, buildings with um, concrete construction um, are going to be a, a problem. Um, if you've got a lot of other wireless communications going on, if you're um, building management system, if you've got security systems that are working with wireless, you know, cordless phones, um, you know, other um, wireless networks that um, will interfere with um, the transmission of these devices. And then there's other sort of noise emitting sources, um, which can be um, various other electronics and um, even things like fluorescent lamps. So all of these things are going to quickly sort of eat into whatever the manufacturer um, transmission rate is. And the, you know, that's not just for the, the um, onset system. That's pretty much for, for all of them. So one of the things that becomes important if you're evaluating this is to sort of, um, you, know, you, you sort of almost have to jump in, um, but expect that, that you, you may be you know, forced to, to sort of add on or be a little bit flexible with your budget um, in order to get the signal everywhere you need it to be. Um, the one other thing to pay attention to with, um, with the, the onset hobo is that these must be plugged into a power source. They have a battery, um, but the battery is really a, a backup. And so um, it will last long enough, like for instance, to get you through um, an accidental power outage like we've seen with, you know, the heat and the storms. But um, that's, this is, again, where you need to pay attention to that um, buffering and sample rate. So for instance, um, the Hobo nodes have uh, a 4,000 sample uh, memory. But you're, if you are logging uh, temperature and relative humidity, you already have to cut that number in half. So your 4,000 samples actually become 2,000 temperature and RH points. So if you're then monitoring, um, let's say, every 15 minutes, that's going to give you, you know, 96 um, samples throughout the day. So you'll have plenty, you know, um, of, of memory to get you back on for a power outage, but it's not going to, um, to work as a, a battery-powered powered unit. So that's just something to um, keep in mind when you evaluate. You know, if you want to place these, do you have um, access to an electrical outlet, or can you, you know, hire, hardwire them in um, already um, to to a power source? Okay. So the next product is something um, that is really. Um, brand new. And so the timing of this webinar was good, because if we had had it last month, I wouldn't have been able to um, talk about this. Um, and in fact, I have to um, say that I have not actually played with this. Uh, the other ones I all have, I have some you know, personal experience with. And so I'm waiting to get my demo unit. But I've spoken ex extensively with um, people at MicroDAC, which is um, I, uh, one of my favorite distributors. And they're really excited about this product. And um, if you go to the Last Car website, it's, it's, they have a little video, um, five-minute video on sort of setting the logger up. And if you watch that, it's sort of easy to, to see why um, MicroDAC feels like this is going to be 
um, a really good product, especially for the kinds of um, users that we have in the audience today. Um, this is also a, a plug-and-play system. It, uh, the, the logger itself, which is this, um, you know, in the, the sort of top right, it's, it's a, you know, sort of a fist size um, uh, a unit. And it will log up to 500,000 readings. Again, you're going to cut that in half for your um, temperature and RH. Um, and it wirelessly transmits the data back to um, your PC computer. Um, it has this groovy LCD, so you can see um, your battery status and um, alarm status and, and your current readings. Um, it has things like the user selectable sampling rate. And um, the other thing that I really liked about it is that um, the sensors have a range detection built into the LCD. So when you go to sort of place them, you can walk around, and in a sense, you get um, the, the same you know, you're sort of looking at like what you would um, see on your cell phone, where um, it actually gives you a, on a scale of one to ten, ten being you know full transmission and one being poor. So um, it's very easy to figure out you know as you go to place them, are you are you within range? Um, what you're, the other screenshots that um, you're seeing here is basically um, you you must have for this unit to to work um, a functional Wi-Fi network within your institution. And so once um, you set this up, and essentially here uh, on the left screenshot, you'd be picking which Wi-Fi system um, you're going to connect onto. And then you'd go to your next screen where you can set up things like your temperature and relative humidity alarm. And um, then uh, once your systems are up and in place, um, you can look at them, you can sort of get your real-time data on, on a screen that looks like this. So um, you can see what, you know, what's going on. You can check your signal strength, battery life, um, an alarm status, and all of that um, from, from your desktop. Um, so again, the system requirements for this are really minimal. Um, you need a PC computer, you need a functional Wi-Fi network, and you need to know your um, wireless key. Uh, and if you have that, then you know this also is a, a, a really um, easy system for almost anyone to to get set up. Um, the the limitations um, for this is that you may need a dedicated router if your security system, if you're working in a museum that has a security system that interferes with the logger communication. So if you've got um, like a firewall and you know, set up and, and you're finding that you can't um, connect on, you could put up, uh, a, you know, an, another router and, and get this set up quite, you know, fairly easily. Um, you sh realistically, you can probably get up to 30 units um, on, on this kind of system. And beyond that, technically, uh, you should be able to get more. But uh, apparently, um, from what I've heard, once you go beyond 30, you start affecting the, the bandwidth. Um, so so the, the functional um, capacity of the system is a little bit smaller than what's actually in their product literature. Uh, as of right now, the system does not have email or text alerts, but, um, but that is apparently in the works, and they hope to have that um, added in, uh, later in the year. So the cost for for one of these sensors is $185. This is um, very cheap and you know, is going to make this a really, I think, strong player um, in this, this market. Um, so if any of you start um, looking at the system, I'll be um, eager to, to hear um, what your experience is. Um, what we have coming up next. Um, oh, sorry. So one more screenshot. This is the EasyLog Wi-Fi software. So what we have up in the, the top screen capture here is sort of their um, nice visual um, way of you know, choosing what, um, what portion of the, the data you want to be looking at on your time scale. And um, you'll see you know, the, the graph looks um, pretty similar to what a lot of us are, are used to, to looking at. Um, so it's um, it's a it's a pretty 
a nice piece of software at a very reasonable price. Um, the next two products that I'm going to talk about are from a company called T&D. Um, T&D has been marketing heavily in the museum field recently, and their products uh, have generated a lot of interest. Uh, I reviewed um, a, a couple of their, their products for the standalone data logger, and, and those were the ones that I was getting um, the most questions on because they are relatively new. And they do have some, some features that are, are sort of different. Um, so first, I want to discuss the, the log easy, which is also a plug and play system. And um, pull up the specs for that one. So um, you, you have sort of this uh, a graphical representation here of how it works. You, this is sort of the, the smallest of the sensors. It's sort of like the, the big fat um, candy bar size. Um, and it's white and, and sort of unobtrusive. What you're seeing in the image the, to, um, with the logger is there's this sort of like clear plastic um, piece that is a, is a little flexible stand that you can um, you know, plunk it in and will hold it um, with easy positioning. The um, thing that looks like a little flash drive is called a wireless dongle. And that needs to be inserted into your PC or laptop into the USB port. And it, you know, it remains there. And so basically, your, um, your, your loggers are going to be transmitting back to that, um, to that, that wireless dongle. Um, they have a 50 meter line of sight transmission range. So the, the line of sight here is is even um, you know less than what what is on the you know a system like the, the hobo nodes, um, and so again for for practical purposes this is going to work best in you know small spaces um, or open spaces, um, and if you have even a setup like what they're showing you here in this diagram, um, you may need more because each of these sort of again, on this idea of this sort of mesh network will communicate to each other. And so is, you know, becomes both a sensor and like a, a transmitter. So you know, passing the data back to um, where it says Office PC to that you know, collection point. Um, this, this is really meant to be a small system. You can support up to 16 of these log EC units. And, um, and each acts as you know, a repeater. Um, they have a fixed 10-minute sampling interval, and um, again, this is one where there's uh, you know a limitation on the humidity measurements. Um, they they have uh, a pretty limited um, buffering memory, and so a system like this, I think, would work really well in a, like a special exhibition space. Um, and you know, you could even do it that you would sort of walk through with your laptop on the dangle. You know, every other day and collect your data if you didn't want to sort of be um, transmitting it all the way back. Um, the starter kit, which includes the wireless dongle, um, a logger, and you know the stand, battery, user manual, you know, um, software, and all of that is 159, and the additional sensors are 99. So this is a you know very it's a very reasonable price, but it's also a system that has you know some severe limitations. If you're in an institution um, where you have um, more technological capability, oh, sorry, this is the, um, a glimpse of the, the log EC software that um, is logging from my children's bathroom, even as we speak. Um, and it's, it's very easy to, um, to, you know, to download, to see, see the graph in real time, which is the little box on the lower right. And then um, you download it into the, the graph. This, the graphing software doesn't allow you to do anything you know, more complicated than really look at it and collect basic, basic statistics. So if you really want to get into data analysis with something like this, you need to be moderately familiar with um, how to use Excel. Um, so the, um, the next unit, uh, the next system um, from T&D is um, the RTR 500 wireless system. Um, and this system has a lot of capabilities, but you, you need to have 
um, someone who's competent with networking solutions um, in your institution. Then there's uh, there's a lot of different pieces on the screen because there's a lot of different ways you can do, you know you can use the system, and um, that's you know sort of one of its its strengths. In the um, bottom right image, you have um, these four units here. Um, the one in the sort of top left is a handheld collector. collector. Um, the uh, the two to the right are um, um, which ones are those? Those are um, the uh, the base station. One of which can um, work if you have a SIM card and a cell um, cell network. It will transmit over um, the cell phone service. And um, the other one is just you know sort of a, a regular um, wireless uh, base station. And then down below is a um, wireless uh, Ethernet base station. You can get that either in a in a wired or a wireless unit. Um, the the two other images that you're seeing here are what the the various um, sensors look like. And um, the temperature in RH is this one here, which is uh, has the, the long probe. And the one that's in the middle, the sort of longer rectangular one with the orange window, that's one that has um, caused a, a lot of interest because it also, that unit will, the, the probes are not attached in this image, but that unit will allow you to also do um, UV and um, light logging. So one of the, the real drawbacks, these can function as standalone loggers. They can transmit optically or wirelessly. The big problem I had with them when I, in, when I reviewed them for the standalone um, conservagram was that the software was really difficult to, to work with. Um, and on this screen, the bottom right is um, their old version of the software, which was the the RTR multi-scale graph. And it doesn't look so bad here on the screen, but um, my colleague and I found it really difficult to manipulate the data to get a good graph out of it. They now have a new version of the software, which is in beta mode. This is what you're seeing on the upper left. Um, I have some issues with the, the pink, yellow, and gray, but that's actually easily changeable. And so their new software, I feel, goes a long way to addressing some of the concerns that I previously had about the system, um, but this is a is a is a bigger system. It's um, it's a lot more uh, flexible, and if you have the technological capability um, to configure and launch the system, um, it it can can do a lot. Um, however, it also comes at a substantially higher price as opposed to looking at you know one to two hundred dollars for um, for your sensors. Um, here, your sensors are, uh, you know, anywhere from three hundred and forty to um, five hundred dollars, depending on which unit you're looking at, just for the temperature and RH, or if you're also adding in the light um, loggers. And one of the the base units runs, you know, anywhere from four hundred dollars to around six hundred dollars. Um, so your startup costs will be um, a little bit higher, but you can, you know, you can do more with the system. Um, the the last um, system that I, I want to discuss a, a little bit, you know, briefly is is the Hanwell system. Hanwell had really a lock on the whole wireless market for a really long time with their radio telemetry system. And what they have now, basically, their products, you know, still work, um, but with radio telemetry. But instead of having to beam it all back to a central collection point which often required that you spend a lot of extra money on repeaters. Now you can beam it back to this sort of um, big box you see in the second image from the left, which is their smart reader too. Um, so this will collect. You can put more, more than one of these in, in um, your building, and they will collect all the wireless you know, radio transmitted data. And then that communicates over your LAN um, it can be set up to um, just download on a on a scheduled basis or on request, and then um, you, as the user, would log into your own server and um, see the real time or um, historical data there. Um, the images that you're seeing, the sort of three on the right, are some of the other kinds of add-ons that you can put onto the system. On the top left, you have your you know just standard temperature and RH, 
And on the right, you've got one of the outdoor sensors. You've got um, the climate box, which also does um, CO2 if you're monitoring air quality. They have this new product called the dust bug. So the handwell system, you know, uh, uh, to start off with your FCC license, your software, and everything is going to start at $3,000. So this isn't a system for anyone who's really budget conscious. But if you're in a, a really large institution, um, and you, or you have some special um, need projects, you know, this this still is, um, although a high-end product, one that you know people are are using, and some you know many institutions are are happy with. So again, the um, the handout is going to have you know this pricing information and um, the features and system requirements for you, as well as the the list of um, vendors. So this just you know sort of shows you you have your different monitoring points. It's beaming back to your smart reader, and then um, you can access that from from your PC. And you can have several smart readers all feeding to your server if you have multiple um, sites or locations. So just to to quickly sort of go back and review, um, you know, we all know that environmental monitoring is now part of you know proper collections care. But it's not like once you get your monitor up, you get to just you know check off the box. Um, you have to you know keep in mind what is the question you're trying to answer. Does wireless monitoring help you answer um, your questions? Are you spending more time you know analyzing your data if you get the wireless capability? Um, and knowing that even if you you know are moving into wireless, that you still need to you know take a close look at the product specs to match your product and capabilities of the product. It really does no good to like go on the Registrar's Committee AAM list and say, you know, what wireless you know, product are you using and you know, and do you like it? Because if if you've chosen your product, you know, to match your, you know, your project, you should be happy. And the trouble comes in, you know, when people aren't um, sort of doing their, their due diligence. Um, that said, uh, you know, don't forget that you know all of the, the products that I mentioned here come from companies that provide very good customer support. Make sure that you've got you know your own in-house capabilities on board with what you want to do, and you know your own time and sanity should should count for count for something in, in getting these systems um, set up. So I think I squeezed it in just under the hour. Um, were there any um, Questions that that um, are coming up that we need to answer, Jenny. We have a few on board, but before we get to questions, let me just go ahead and post our survey. It's very short. Please take the time to fill it out. Um, we read everyone's responses, and it's so helpful. Um, and so now, if you guys have questions, we'll just go over a little bit. Um, we had a question a while ago about limited cell phone reception within the building and how that might affect a wireless system? Well, so for instance, um, if you have um, limited cell phone in the in um, access, cell phone <laughs> reception in your building, that um, could mean two things. Um, one, it could mean that you would not want something like the RTR um, 500 um, data collector that works with the, the GCM, that works off the cell phone you know, <laughs> system. Um, but what it probably means is that um, you're in a building that has, you know, a lot of concrete or you know stone construction. Um, so, you know, for instance, one thing that I know, like if you go to the Met, they're very happy that you can't get cell phone service, in, you know, in the in the building. They feel like they don't want people talking on their cell phones. It impacts the visitor experience. But um, but the flip side is that if you know you would know that 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 says something about your ability to transmit a wireless signal in um, within within um, your building. So that's going to mean that your um, you know your your system is going to become more expensive for the need to sort of relay your your signal more frequently, um, and it you know or it means that you need to look at a system that allows you to quickly get back to the nearest sort of Ethernet you know port. Um, so that you're not sort of trying to transmit it all the way back to a central collection point. Interesting. We also have Anne from New York who has a couple questions. One about what happens when the laptop is closed or you're out of the office. Okay. 
So, um, so that's exactly again where this like buffering memory um, comes in. You know, for some of these products, the the manufacturers will tell you, you know, your computer should you know always be on. Um, or if it's if it's off, um, that's where you need to make sure that that you know buffering memory is going to be able to hold enough you know sampling points for for how often you're um, you're sampling that it can you know store it in the memory and then when you come in on Monday and, and power your computer back up it'll you know all of that will sort of you know flow down at that point but if you um, but if it doesn't have enough memory essentially you start you know losing that data and that's you know that sort of defeats the purpose and then also from Anne wondering about the best recommendation for a unit in monsoon humidity something <laughs> in the tropics <laughs> and that's a hard one um, <laughs> I, um, I guess, you know, I'd have to think about that, and Anne, I'm happy to, to correspond with you um, after the, the webinar. Um, you know, m most of these sensors will, will work in, in these environments, just like, you know, like any, whether it's a standalone or wireless, you know, the, the accuracy of your of your system is is going to need to be checked, you know, more frequently in an extreme environment. I think you know the the big question there is also you know do you lose power on a regular basis, and if that's the case, you know, is um, is is losing data um, a risk that that you are willing to take versus you know having the the real time data? Um, so let's let's. Talk about that more on, you know, maybe on the the C to C um, online website. So one other question about Anwell: um, Does that send alerts and alarms? Yes, it can be. Um, if you're using that smart reader too, it can be set up to do that. And then one more from Emma: We have the best unit or system for enclosed cases with no power source. So. Um, so that's where something like uh, you know the um, the EL Wi-Fi system, this this brand new system, um, I have really high hopes for. The Log EZ would um, be uh, appropriate for that. But again, with the Log EZ, you're really only going to get um, a six month um, life expectancy out of that single double A battery. Um, you could also use the RTR 500 system in a closed case, and, and you have a, a substantially longer battery life on that. But again, you need to, to be in an institution that has the capability to get that one set up. But that one, you could um, you know, sort of snake the, the probe in also, you know, make it um, really, really nice and small. But those would be your, your three options. Do we have any more questions from the audience? And of course, any questions that we haven't gotten to or that you think of later, we can continue on the discussion board. OK. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you to our audience for participating. Again, please take the time to fill out this survey we've listed up at the top left corner. Uh, we read all your comments. So thank you so much, and have a great afternoon. Thank you very much, Jenny, Kristen, and Susan.